We're back Good for deal. more with Robert Williams here on Modern Art Blitz. I'm your host, Matt Gleason. We're broadcasting live from the floor of the L.A. Art Show. Robert, in let me get the date right. If I'm wrong, feel free to correct me. In 1994, you decided it was time for a new type of art magazine. Well, it <clears throat> there was more to it than that. There's more to it than that. Uh, I'd had a series of very successful art shows of paintings called zombie mystery paintings at different after-hours clubs around L.A., the Zero One and uh, La Luz de Jesus and some clubs in New York. And there's other artists like me. So a group of artists were starting to form. So there was enough representational wild feral art being done that... Uh, there'd come time to unify it in some way. And I was getting an, an awful lot of write-ups and rock magazines and tattoo magazines and car magazines and girly magazines. That uh, There was so much publicity, I really wondered if we needed an art world. <clears throat> but I was talking to this gal at a, a, a tattoo magazine, and uh, I... She was talking about uh, how the, the articles on me and other artists were such successes. And I told her, well, maybe you might want to think about doing a magazine like the magazines done in the 20s and 30s, the surrealist magazines like Minotaur and a few others. And uh, I thought that just went in one ear and out the other. And she called me back in two weeks and says, well, I've... Um, I've got that magazine for you. And I said, well, what do you mean? She says, well, I talked to my publisher. And this is, she was in New York. She said, I've got this publisher. And he says he would, he, he would do this. Hey, that's a nice callback. So, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a tattoo magazine that I'm talking about. And she knew the, the guy did girly magazines and biker magazines. So we're not at the, the type of, top of the intellectual scale here, see. <clears throat> So anyway, they came up with the name of uh, Art Alternatives, and I was the, I was the um, conduit to find artists for this publication. So anyway, uh, two or three issues come out, and it was an enormous success. Wow. So in, anyway, this was like maybe uh, 92, 93, somewhere in there. And anyway, the publisher had some falling out with the girl that put the magazine together and he fired her so I, I guess he presumed that this was just a uh, some kind of crazy art and you could just get any kind of crazy art for this magazine so the magazine lost its common underground thread that it had and the thing just kind of dwindled so uh I was talking with uh, Greg Escalani and we said you know that was a shame that thing went down the toilet you know and uh so we started thinking about other places maybe to see if someone would buy that title. And I was talking to Timothy Leary to get me in touch with... Uh, the uh, Timothy Leary. The Timothy Leary, see if he'd get me in touch with uh, Larry Flint. And Larry Flint wasn't interested. And so I talked to a couple of other people. And Greg says, well, why don't you... You've had a bunch of work in uh, Thrasher Magazine. Why don't you go up to San Francisco? The, and you were popular with the skateboarders. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, uh, I made contact with uh, uh, the people up there. Uh, so, um, I went up there and had a meeting with them, and they said, well, we're, we're, we're up for this. Wow. So, they tried to buy the title from this publishing company. Uh, the Fausto Vitella was the head publisher up there at high speed that did Thrasher, and he said, well, we're... This sounds like a good idea. We tried to buy that title of Art Alternatives, and the guy wouldn't sell it. So, uh oh. So he said, "Hell, yeah, let's come up with our own title." So I, I wrote a list of 125 titles, and then they went through my list, and they found about eight or ten. It took them to a lawyer to make sure they were clean, and one of my names was juxtaposed. Wow. Okay. What, what were some of the, can I ask what some of the others were? Do you, do you remember some of them? Oh, they were, they were out there. Oh, they, yeah. <laughs> they were out there, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, anyway, uh, they started this magazine with 23,000 copies through uh, um, Thrasher's distributing, distributors. 
and then the thing just went immediately went into the black. It just sold. It really sold well. So it was a quarterly. So it sold and sold, and then they said, well, let's make that thing bi-monthly. So they made it bi-monthly, and it hiked up the print run, and it was just really doing good. Now, <clears throat> here's an interesting fact about its success. Not only was it selling real good, but it was had one of the largest sell-throughs of any magazine on the newsstand. Oh. In other words, if you, if you have a 1,000 magazines and you send them out to a distributor, He's going to send 600 back to be you know, made into pulp because only 400 are expected to sell. So That's actually a good rate, too, for a lot of magazines. Yeah, so this juxtapose, man, was just, it, its sell-through was enormous. And, it, you know, not only that, but it would after someone bought it, it'd go through two or three hands. So this thing was really getting a lot of press. And the, the early juxtaposes were underground. They were, you know, they had some gnarly material in them you know but uh there was no innocent little puppies and kittens in the early issues you know so anyway it got bigger and bigger and then they went monthly and then it went uh uh then it outsold art forum and it's wow bigger and bigger but the, the, the art schools wouldn't let it on their premises and it wasn't taken seriously and then it art then it outsold art in america i don't know if that's, that's then after, good. after about a year, then it outsold Art News. That was the top of the heap. That was, was the top of the heap. That, one, that yeah. was it. That was, then this little funky art magazine become the top-selling art magazine on planet Earth. So then it started showing up in art schools, and, you know, the, the academic art world, you know, had to kind of deal with it. You know? and, and, and then the art schools, all, all of a sudden now, or at least after a while, they started advertising in it, right? The, yeah. the one way to reach aspiring artists. Well, you can walk around this fair, and I'm not talking about Little Topia. You can look at a lot of art around here that's got representational art in it that would not have been here if it was not for Juxtapose, see? Oh, yeah. So it, it wasn't a, a matter of my ego to be the big man to do Juxtapose. It's just somebody had to lay on the bob wire you uh -huh. know, to, for the other artists to cross over, so... That's a, I think that's what you mean when you say I was like the first or some kind. I had some significant. You laid on the barbed wire for everybody else. Yeah, yeah. So uh, speak for a minute about uh, the one of the co-founders with you was the late Greg Escalante. Greg Escalante was a very important person in Juxtapose, and he was the curator. And he brought in so many young, talented people. Now, Greg, Greg was like the Mother Teresa of art. He was just <laughs> wonderful. See, now, <clears throat> I'm, I was considered like the grouchy old man, and let me defend myself. I've always thought it was not right to just go get everybody and try to make them artists because you're leading them down a primrose lane. It's going to be a heartbreak situation sometime. But Greg didn't see it like that. No. He said he wanted to f toss the flowers across the field, you know, and make every everyone happy. And um, and, I, and he did a wonderful job. He helped so many people. And Juxta oh yeah, juxtapose help if not hundreds, thousands of young people to uh, at least get into the mud where they can't get out. You know? and, and and those who were helped, not all necessarily the same quality of deserving either. Yeah, yeah. But but then you you have to factor in one thing: the larger juxtapose got the more it tended to, to dilute out because it had such a large audience it had to make a lot more people happy, see? That's kind of the nature of growth and politics, That's the nature right? of growth, you know. You gotta make more people happy. And I'm the, I'm the grouchy old fart that, you know, it's just still doing the underground art and upsetting people and, you know, that's, well, I'm pathetic I might be, you know. And you are, um Still, you still have a little column in there every month, right? No, no, no. I, I add stuff. I used to do all the editorials at one time. I took in charge. I, I, when I went up there and negotiated the magazine, I told them how it was going to be and what kind of typeset and, uh, you know, what was going to be on the cover. And I, uh, I, I was like the dictatorial editor up there for, you know, three or four years. But, uh, you know, then I'm, that was becoming an occupation, and I, uh, the, the magazine started to have a life of its own, and, and uh, Greg understood it. Greg was far more flexible with me and uh, uh, much more caring, you know, and this is where Greg was really a wonderful person. He helped so many people, at, as we learned later, probably at his expense. Oh, yeah. You know, so. Um, and so, uh, but you don't, you don't have an editor's column in there? 
uh, once no, in a while? No, no. They, they drag me in there every so often on certain, really? s- certain uh, subjects. Special, special assignment yeah, reporter? Well, so, something needs to be said or something about politics or some art thing. I, I, I'll jump in there. Uh, uh, something ought to be mentioned right now while I'm on that. I've got your attention. This was not always uh, a, a loose alternative world that I'm functioning in. Zap Comics, for which I came from, <coughs> uh, was noticed by some very intelligent people. And w- one of the most important people in Los Angeles, in the United States, and Europe for that matter, was a fellow named Walter Hopps. Walter Hopps was the guy that started Ferris Gallery. He was responsible for 16 or 17 of the most important artists in the United States and the world for that matter. He's a guy that got... Um, uh, uh, Andy Warhol, his first show, and got brought. Um, 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 he 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 just was. An, 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 an what was what was your relationship with Walter? Well, I met Walter a long time ago on a, a situation that wasn't so friendly, but we become very very close friends. And then I found out that he had a show at the um, uh, Corcoran uh, Gallery in Washington D.C. in 1971 with Zap Comics. So this guy was like way ahead of his time, you know? and so um, uh, this contact with the, the, the very top of the art world. Well, Walter Hopps was designated in Europe as the top museum curator in the world just before he died. He, wow. he died 10 years ago, and he was considered by just about every artificial in the highest academic circles as Walter Hopps is the top is top of the Pile. Front, front page obituary in the L.A. Times. Yeah, and, and uh, he uh, was a very, very close friend of mine. He understood what, what Juxtapose was. He wanted to write for Juxtapose. You know, he uh, championed it. So you have a, a circle there where we're going from, you know, completely from the top of the academic world to acknowledge this thing. So, Great. So. Okay, we have one more segment to do. We're going to take just another little break, and I want to talk about uh, some of the stuff that you've got going on now because you've got a traveling exhibition yeah, that's yeah, been going on that's for quite right. a while. So we'll be back right after this. Okay. 